Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, barometer debate session entitled Ethics and Values in Science for Policy, part of our broader Science for Policy conference. Um, I hope that you can already see on your screen uh, the first of our challenging and controversial questions. This is not going to be the main theme of the day's discussion, but it's just a little test, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, but we want to jump straight into the, the controversial debates rather than faffing around with like panelist introductions and and, and discussion and, uh, and so on. So um, you are going to see in this session a series of challenging statements about the ethics of scientific advice for policy. And how it will work is that I will invite our panel here and the audience, you yourselves, to vote on each of those statements, uh, indicating how strongly you agree or disagree. Um, to lead and inspire the debate that will follow, we have the five fantastic panelists whose friendly faces you can now see on the screen. And in the interest of time, and because they have graciously allowed me to do this, I will quickly introduce them. We have, in the order that I can see them on my list, we have uh, Heather Douglas, who is Associate Professor at Michigan State University. She's the author of uh, a book on this very topic called Science, Policy and the Value-Free Ideal. Uh, spoiler, she doesn't think the value-free ideal can be realized. Um, and she's joining us at an unearthly time in the morning because she is based on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So hello, Heather. We have also with us um, Migla Lokita, who is a professor in the Faculty of Law at Universitat Pompeo Fabra. And she is a member of the European Group on Ethics in Science and the New Technologies, whose role is to directly advise the president of the European Commission on ethical issues, uh, as it were the sister organization to the group of chief scientific advisors that, uh, that I'm connected with. We have on the screen Dr. Ron Iphoven, who is an independent consultant. He has quite an expansive CV, which I will not uh, run through in great detail, but it includes uh, uh, a good deal of science policy advice. Most significantly, perhaps for our purposes, he led the project ProRes, which put together and proposed an ethics and integrity framework for scientific research. And I also found out that he studied at my alma mater of the University of York in the north of England. We have Siobhan O'Sullivan, who is an ethicist by training. She is a professor with the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, where she teaches medical students. She's also executive director of the Royal Irish Academy, and she has worked as a policymaker in bioethics for the Irish Department of Health. And last but not least, our fifth panelist, Stephen van Hoogt. He is the head of viral diseases at Cienzano, which is Belgium's public health agency. Um, and as you can imagine, he has been very busy in recent years advising government and has made regular appearances in the media here in Belgium throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. I also live in Belgium and his name was very familiar to me long before I met him face to face. So those are our panelists. Uh, welcome again to the audience. I see Maura joining as we speak. That's great. Um, we, this is set up as a Zoom meeting rather than a webinar to enable maximum kind of participation from not only myself and the speakers, but also from the audience. And for that reason, you are free to turn your camera on and off and your microphone on and off as you see fit. My colleague Nina, who is masquerading as the, I think the scientific advice mechanism, um, has been tasked with inviting people to switch on their cameras and microphones um, when uh, we would like people to contribute. So I'll explain in a moment how that's going to work. In fact, I'll explain it right now. Um, the screen share that you are seeing, this big white screen that says question zero at the top, is provided by a service called Mentimeter. And if you have not already, now is the time to go to menti.com. You will see the link in the chat and also on the screen. Or if you have a mobile device, which is actually quite convenient way to do this, you can scan the QR code with your camera and you'll be taken directly to menti.com. And when you get there, enter this code 76296965, again, that you can see on the screen. I can see 15 people have already done that. Um, you can keep that running in, in another tab on your browser if you're using one device, or as I said, most conveniently, perhaps if you have a phone on you, you can use the phone uh, to access menti.com while you watch and listen to and engage with the webinar on whatever main device they're using. The reason for that is that um, throughout this session, as I mentioned, I will ask you to vote on controversial statements. You present with each statement on the device that you go to menti.com on, and you can basically put yourself on a continuum from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And as people do that, we will see on the screen that I'm sharing the voting evolving. So we see currently now 
22 people in the room, and of those who have voted our uh, average opinion, ah, okay, we're right, we're now right in the middle. So on the continuum of hot dog is a sandwich to hot dog is not a sandwich, or rather strongly agree that hot dog is a sandwich on the right, down to strongly disagree that a hot dog is a sandwich on the left. We have uh, basically smack in the middle. The average of votes is exactly three. I guess the curvy line, which I actually wasn't expecting to see, is showing that distribution of votes. So that means we have somebody who strongly disagrees, or maybe a number of people who strongly disagree. Nobody kind of disagrees mildly. And then, as you can see, the curve gets a bit uh, taller towards the right hand side as well. So um, how it will work is that I will present each of these statements in turn. Our question zero is already on your screen. And I will invite, firstly, one or two or three of our panelists to uh, comment on, on what they see and uh, perhaps indicate how they voted and why of why it was difficult or why it's interesting or basically whatever you want to say. Panelists, you don't need to raise your hands. I'm going to assume that you always have something interesting to say. So I will just um, I will invite you to unmute yourselves and speak uh, when we're talking about each statement like that. Um, audience members, once the panelists have said a few words, it would also be great if any of you who would like to speak could do so. And for that, the easiest way is for you to raise your hand in Zoom. So the little yellow hand, right? You click the little yellow hand uh, icon, and that will indicate to me and my colleague Nina mm -hmm. um, that you would like to contribute. And then you could turn on your camera and unmute yourself, or you'll be invited to do so by Nina and uh, and have your say in the debate as well. Um, you can say whatever you would like to say, but since we only have a few minutes to discuss each statement, I have two requests so we can get as many contributions as possible. The first request is very obvious. Please keep it short, concise. And the second request is I'd ask you to raise your hand and contribute if you have something to add to the discussion. So something that hasn't already been said, don't put your hand up and just say, I agree with the last person. So maybe you place yourself in a different place on the continuum from the last speaker. Maybe you place yourself in the same place, but for a different reason. Those things are interesting. Um, I'm less interested in hearing people just say, yes, I agree. Quite right. Absolutely. Um, because that would just take up time where we could have had people fighting and arguing, which is much more fun. And the final thing is, uh, please, when you finish speaking, please take down your hand by clicking once again the raise hand icon. Otherwise, we'll get confused about who still wants to speak and who does not still want to speak. You can re-vote as the set debate ensues. So if you like what you hear and you think, oh, yeah, that's a good point, actually. Maybe I do think a hot dog is a sandwich. You can cast your vote once again and the, the thing will update live. You can also comment and disagree with each other in the text comments on Zoom. OK, that's quite enough spiel from me. I'm going to give maybe 10 more seconds for anybody else to cast their vote on the hot dog as a sandwich thing. It looks like those who have not voted yet might have a casting, <laughs> a decision making role since we're still smack in the middle. I should vote, actually. Let me do that. I, I also have strong opinions about this hot dog thing. OK. I should also. So perhaps I'll introduce myself. My name is Toby Wardman. I am the head of communications for the scientific uh, advice mechanism of the European Commission. Um, as I mentioned, we have the sister organization of the uh, European Group on Ethics. Our role is to advise European commissioners on scientific issues. Seven, six, two, nine, six, nine, six, five. All right, I'll look at the sandwich. There we go. Ah, OK. <laughs> OK, so if everybody's ready, we will make a start on our first real question. Here comes uh, question one, or rather statement one. Science advisors should present scientific evidence and uncertainties only. Interpreting the evidence should be left to the advisee. I think it's probably unhelpful if I try to provide my own interpretation uh, to these questions before we've started the debate, because I mean, what do I know? I suspect people on this call are much more expert than me. So please go ahead and vote. I see already votes pouring in. Um, I'm going to pick almost at random, but Stephen, as someone who has done a lot of scientific advising and I suspect has encountered exactly this question yourself, perhaps you might like to make a comment of where you voted and and, and why. 
Yes, well, um, I think from my experience, it's uh, important as a science advisor, you also help uh, the authorities, the politicians, the government, how to interpret the, the evidence and the science, because uh, otherwise it might become very difficult for them uh, to really implement it in good policy. I can give a very simple example. Eh? If you wanted to reduce transmission of the virus to protect the hospitals, okay, the, the advice was actually quite simple. You need to limit the amount of exposures, the amount of contacts uh, which cause risk. And we could even calculate the amount of contacts you were able to allow on a daily basis. Um, but that for a government or a politician, they, they really can't turn that into an actionable thing. Uh, so we also need to explain what are the different ways they might do that. Uh, you can close down hospitality, uh, you can cancel events. And then, of course, what we tried to do was try to calculate in, in the way that is possible what would be the impact of different decisions. In that way, give them some guidance on how to do that. So the advice is very simple. You reduce the number of contacts, you can put a number on that, but then you really need to help them also. What, what, what are the different possibilities? Uh, can you give us a ranking? Uh, what has the biggest impact? What has a lesser impact? And then, of course, it's up to them to make the decisions. And some of these things were maybe not acceptable, others were more acceptable. And that's really in the field, I think, of uh, politicians. And there's a kind of a, a democratic process also there that should be involved. Uh, but it was important to, to help them with the interpretation. Otherwise, I think it was not uh, always manageable. So that's my experience on that topic. So I would rather uh, disagree with uh, saying that you have to stick to the, only the advice and not help with interpretation. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I wonder if uh, you're, it looks like you're somewhat on the majority side there, but there are a number of people who have uh, voted towards the middle or more towards agreeing with this statement that interpretation should be left to the advisee. I wonder, Heather, if you have anything to say on this topic. Okay, so I do agree with Stephen that interpretation is necessary, but it's partly because if you literally just say, I'm just going to present the evidence and the uncertainties, imagine I'm presenting to science, uh, um, your policymakers, the climate evidence. It's a huge amount of data. What does it mean? Um, that has to be done with scientific expertise, the interpretation of what the evidence means. And that requires some interpretation of it that is based on the expertise that scientists have. So interpretation is essential. That's kind of oh, a boring great. view. Maybe yeah. someone. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Migla, you have your hand. I, do you? Uh, do you? Yes, you um, told us not to raise those. So yeah. I, I, I was raising a finger. <laughs> Please go ahead. No, 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 I just wanted, I, I connect this to what we, we had in the in the session yesterday that you, Toby, were chairing, and our chair of the, our president, our EG in ethics, uh, ethics group uh, on, on science and new technologies were saying is that information alone, our scientific evidence alone do not solve crisis, right? So I think this is important. You, you need interpretation and you need help in interpretation. And another thing I was thinking about many times, you feel, I very much agree with what Stephen and Heather were saying, but it's also about how the scientific advisors bring their own experience in advising, and they might, you know, have this experience when their help in interpreting facts was missing and certain decisions were made that were not, that were erroneous or mistaken or, or whatever, right? So many times uh, this additional uh, input to, the, to, to help the policymakers to interpret uh, scientific facts might come from the previous experience when this interpretation was, this help was actually lacking and uh, caused certain negative consequences. So that was my quick finger point. It seems like we all agree so far that interpretation is necessary. I suppose the question is more like who has to do the interpretation. Um, I, 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 the, there are certainly some audience members who voted in the opposite direction. I wonder if anybody will be brave enough to, to raise that little yellow hand um, and and uh, perhaps suggest why. While we wait and see if anybody is brave enough, Ron. Yeah, while well, uh, that's happening, Toby, um, just a few, few comments. Uh, it's, it's a bit like the previous, the first question. It depends on how you define a sandwich. 
Right. And uh, for me, when I first looked at this, I was thinking, well, what's a science advisor? Is that the scientist? And in terms of the debate that we had yesterday, it was recognized that some scientists are good advisors and some not so good. Um, so the important thing is, you you know, uh, th uh, this statement is qualified by the fact that we don't know necessarily who the science advisor is. The same is in terms of the advisee. Are we talking about a policymaker, an executive decision? Are we talking about legislators? So um, you know, my vote was qualified by not fully being clear about who these um, role players actually are. Um, but, you know, that but, actually complicates, um, <laughs> you know, the ability to make a statement here. That's um, fair, then, but then I want to ask you, what, so why why does it make a difference? Like, so in, in what situations would it would you be persuaded to, to vote more disagree and more, when would you say more strongly agree? Yeah, well, I, I mean, this is linked to the idea of the notion. And again, this I think I got the tone of this a little bit yesterday, and that is the notion there's an almost an idealistic notion of scientists as seeking the truth and you know the facts are the facts and you know um and the policymakers should listen to the scientists and of course we we are none of us are naive enough to believe that scientists have vested interests of their own and the problem is in, in how they declare that and whether those are easily declared or even in some cases whether those are acknowledged and known by the scientists themselves you know science is not um you know value free um, and so it's the recognition of those kinds of issues. Uh, I mean, my view about this is that all scientists, whether they're advisors or not, should be able to set up a series of option appraisals. And that's the key role of a scientist to say, you know, if you do X, it's likely that Y will happen. You know, it might be a probability statement. It's something of that nature. Uh, and, and an attempt to be devoid, if you like, or to hold to one side one's vested interests and one, one's preferred outcomes. And it's the same as the advisees, because the advisee can be a political advisor, it seems to me, who's, you know, the medium between the legislator, the executive and the scientific evidence. Um, and, and again, the advisee then, as a political advisor, should be uh, laying out the option appraisals to those policy makers. Very good. Siobhan, I'll ask you to comment in a moment, but I just, I, I, I suppose the thinking behind this question being uh, controversial, since we're all kind of um, uh, collecting around a fairly consensual position, is that there has to be something left for the, for the policymaker to do to it kind of exert their judgment, right? That the idea is you can do as a scientist or a science advisor a certain amount of interpretation, perhaps as you say, Ron, probabilities, but that at the end of the day, the policymaker still has to be able to make decisions, and that in itself involves interpreting the evidence. Siobhan. Yeah, thanks, Toby. I suppose you've made my point for me. Um, I was a little bit mischievous Sorry. and actually said that I, I um, disagreed with the statement. But obviously, as Heather and Stephen have pointed out, there needs to be a level of interpretation. But to Ron's point, um, exactly that, that, that you know, that, that scientists are, of course, bringing their own underlying values or indeed, they're obviously, you know, bringing um, a particular frame through which they're interpreting the evidence themselves. That's why scientists don't always agree on data sets and the interpretation of data sets. So I think that it is important, at least, um, that scientists are very clear about the frame through which they're analyzing data and that that's fed back to policymakers so that that is completely transparent. But I do think to the point about evidence and scientific evidence is but one input into a policy decision. And I think we need to be really clear about that. So I think um, Stephen gave a very good example. We would have had similar examples during our public health crisis in the same way. So as a policymaker, you may get a very clear, you may, you may be in a fantastic position where there is a clear scientific consensus about what should be done. The question about whether that can actually be funded, what the current complex landscape or ecosystem policy ecosystem actually is and how this new policy might impact on that, unintended consequences, all of those kinds of issues have to be taken into consideration. It's not simply the scientific evidence. So as you say, there, there is a role for the policymaker, a very complex role in having clear evidence presented 
um, but also being able to interpret that evidence within a wider policy ecosystem. And I think that's important to remember. Great, thanks very much. Um, Heather, do you think there's uh, some ambiguity also around what interpreting means, right? Because interpreting, it could be, it could, it could mean, as Rob was suggesting, it, you know, just like playing out what the evidence seems to indicate, attaching probabilities to it, indicating what the results might be if you follow particular policy lines. Or it could alternatively be something much more value laden, where the idea is looking at the evidence and figuring out which option you want to take for other reasons. Um, and there's an additional, yeah, there's an additional option, which interpreting could be, uh, you know, what possible, as Stephen said, policy interventions, uh, like what kinds of options are actually, and what Ron was saying, follow on from that. Now, I just want to be really clear. I think not just that the value for ideal is a bad ideal for science because it's unattainable, but it's actually, I think, the wrong ideal. Um because values are an essential component for deciding what to look at and how to interpret what you're looking at. And so I would really like science advisors to also be clear about the values they're using for interpreting the evidence. Um, not And to stop thinking of values as like a contaminant that biases things. Um, values in the wrong role can be biasing, but Values just playing good judgment functions in the background makes science and science advising more responsible in that properly ethical way. So um, I think that has to be part of interpretation. And then that should be part of what's communicated as well to the advisee, ideally. Gotcha. Yeah, absolutely. Can I come Again, Toby, is that all right? Please um, do. I think it's quite important in, um, I, uh, in terms of what Heather and Sean have just said, and it does link. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't promote my own, own recent progress project, which um, was intended to try to set up a framework that uh, for all non-medical sciences that was equivalent to the Oviedo Convention and the Helsinki Declaration for non-medical uh, for medical sciences and health sciences. And the idea was that, um, you know, there should be a, a framework that we could all, you know, that us non-medical scientists should be able to sign up to. Uh, um, before we went very far in that, um, it struck it, it struck me quite um, forcibly from one of our consortium partners, the European Policy Centre, which is an eminent uh, influencer, if you like, in policymaking in Europe. Uh, and they said, we, we can't sign up to the things that the scientists sign up to. Um, and, you know, uh, and the researchers, we're more than just scientists and researchers, we're a very valuable and influential think tank. So it, it steered the project away from the idea of science in that kind of purist notion as as influencing policy towards what I, I um, eventually called evidence gathering organizations, egos. And there are a lot of very <laughs> big egos out there. OK, and they're important egos because policymakers you know, it's a contested domain. We know that science scientists are in that domain where there, there are other influences and more, many more effective influences in terms of policymaking, including powerful think tanks that policymakers will often go back to before they'll go to the science because it's a trusted connection. It's, it's a reliable, trusted source of evidence. So uh, my view of research became, and therefore of science became, who are the evidence gatherers and how might they best and most most ethically influence policy decisions? Uh, and quite honestly, that then colored my view of all these subsequent questions that we're going to de discuss soon. Thank they're, you. They're very good. Well, then I hope at some point during the meeting, you will find time to drop a link in the chat for everybody who's interested to read the results of your project, because that will, I think, will be very relevant to what we're discussing. Great. It is time to move on. Our audience so far uh, have not uh, woken up of someone of the courage to disagree with any of the panelists, but we'll keep watching for those yellow hands. Here comes question two, or statement two. If the politicians ignore my advice, I have a duty to speak out publicly. Cast your votes now, ladies and gents.
But this one is evolving in a very interesting way. Siobhan, I think I came to you last for the first question. So do you want to have the first right of reply on this? What do you think? So I'm going to be a bit controversial here. <laughs> and um, I'm going to say I actually voted that I don't think they have a duty to speak publicly. And I'll tell you why. I want to frame that uh, carefully. Um, I think the first question is, why would a scientist want to speak publicly in respect of um, a politician ignoring their advice? Are they really, uh, do they not have the necessary humility to understand that there may be a reasonable disagreement and um, that their advice may have been taken on board, but that did not result in the um, desired policy position that they may, may wish to have seen adopted? So um, I think that's important. Um, one has to wonder why somebody would feel the need to speak out if a politician ignored their advice. If you wanted to be cynical, is it to avoid any kind of negative feedback from colleagues? Um, because you obviously have a particular position, you've advanced that position, it hasn't been adopted, and therefore you want to avoid um, any kind of accusation or approbation from your colleagues in respect of the position that's been adopted that you somehow fed into it, in which case that serves you personally as the scientist or the advisor, but doesn't necessarily serve, um, uh, have any impact on the policy or the public good. So I think one questions why that is. Obviously, so here's the caveat, that if it, you're part of a, a collaborative um, process or if you're part of an advisory group that's giving advice, uh, you have to have been given the opportunity to express your views, to put forward the evidence, um, that it needs to have been a robust um, process. Um, and that's clear. However, if it's a situation where your evidence has been, where the evidence that you've put forward has been misconstrued or has been distorted, then of course you should speak out publicly and point that out. Um, but that is of a different nature, I think, to disagreeing with the policy position that's been adopted. Um, and I think we need to be careful to separate those two things. And I'd finally finish up, Toby, with saying that the reason I take that kind of more reserved position is that I think it's really important that we create safe spaces for knowledge brokers, for policymakers to be able to discuss in a robust um, transparent way differences of opinion, but to have a trusting environment there that we know we can do that without somebody leaving the room and then saying, well, X said, or my advice wasn't, um, wasn't taken on board because there was a lobby in the group that said something else. I think it undermines that process of collective decision making. Thanks. Yes, there's a practical element as well as an ethical one, right? That you, if you destroy trust, even if you feel are doing the right thing in principle, it can be counterproductive. Yeah, okay, interesting. Um, Migla, what do you think on that? When did you vote on this question? Uh, okay, I, I, I have kind of, uh, well, I'm in the middle because I, I am, I, I'm, you know, I have, I, I see the point in both uh, keeping uh, uh, one's mouth shut and also to speaking out, right? Because on the one hand, so my point is, and I'm not, you know, <laughs> helping, I guess, too much in finding the right, the right, uh, in one way or the other, right? So uh, I think uh, if you're a part of the uh, advisors committee, so you're, you're like officially representing uh, your, your, your scientific field and you're ignored on the, on the certain aspects. So I think, you know, actually it's kind of you're being used, right? Because when you say what they want to hear, so uh, you're, you're taken into account. And when you say something that they, uh, the policymakers maybe don't, don't like, so you're become, uh, you're, you're become, you're kind of trashed, right? So you're, you no longer exist as a source of knowledge, of facts, of, of scientific advice. Other thing though, is the, the uh, and of course, I understand that even scientific advisors, and not even, but scientific advisors as well have values, right? And they have intellectual integrity and uh, they, they, they have a right to speak, speak up their voice. What I do think about is, uh, this is why I didn't put five, uh, was that 
it is also, uh, I think scientific advisors also should think about what they say and when. That might be also an interesting point on, on, the, on the matter because one thing is my need to, you know, express my, 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 my opinion, my views that were ignored, but another thing is when I'm doing that. And, you know, one's scientific advice should not become a hazard if it is uh, spoken up uh, in the wrong moment. So this is why I'm in the middle and not very sure myself where should I put my vote. Thank you very much. Uh, Anna Maria Carusi, I see your little yellow hand. Would you like to unmute yourself and say hello? Hi there. Um, yeah, I want to wanted to actually just add to that point about when. It's a question of when, because often when scientific advice has been taken up, you know, the, 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 it's a complex moment where many views are being expressed and, and the policy moments and the po policy interventions have to be timed really carefully. But what I do think that scientific advisors have a duty to do is to keep a record, to really detail their records of what advice they are given and what is the, what actions are taken on the basis of their advice because they have to be geared towards the possibility that in the future they are going to be asked about this. So I, so I think that there's a kind of orientation towards disclosing that even if you don't disclose, that you have to have as you give the advice and be sure that you note, you, you keep notes on what's happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, this is a, a very kind of uh, measured debate. The reason I'm a little bit surprised is that I have had conversations with scientists and science advisors on this topic before, and they've often been very divided, very in a very kind of polarized way. That you'll get people who who will strongly say, "Look, as a scientist, my duty is to follow where the evidence leads me. I must be. I must have freedom to speak as I see what the evidence, you know, uh, what the evidence yeah. says." And if I'm ignored on that, uh, it's my duty to communicate it in other ways. And those who, who will take a kind of very strong opposite view and say, well, actually, as a scientific advisor, I enter into this deal. And under that deal, I get the privilege of being able to communicate with policymakers directly. But the flip side of that is I then get the responsibility to abide by uh, and keep a mouth shut about anything that I don't agree with. Um, I wonder if there's any, any of our panelists. Oh, so let me ask yeah. Um, Stephen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, have you, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Toby, I just wanted to comment because for me, all these things, uh, yeah, I've experienced it in real life. Eh? And actually, I had also a little bit of a conflict of interest throughout the pandemic because I uh, had two roles. On the one hand, I was a science advisor, uh, but I was also a spokesperson for the government, uh, you know, explaining to the public uh, the measures that were decided by the government. So. Sometimes there was a good correspondence between both, sometimes not. And it's also important to keep the trust uh, with politicians, between science and politicians. So that's important. I also needed to respect that. But there were moments in the pandemic when politicians uh, failed to decide uh, what, they, what, what was really needed. And uh, the thing was, we were quite certain that this was, this was about to cost lives, many lives. And that's when I thought it was really needed to speak up. Uh, I tried to do that in a way that I always clarified my role. This is what the government decided. They have many reasons to decide or not to decide or to wait. Uh, but this is what we as scientists have advised. And personally, if you ask me as a scientist, that's what I think you should do. I can give a very concrete example. Right before the second wave, uh, October, November 2020, Belgium was waiting too long to act, um, and we knew we were waiting too long. And one moment I just contacted, uh, or Belga, which is the a press uh, agency in Belgium, contact me to, for some advice, and I told, I just say them, tell the people they should stay at home right now, uh, even if the government doesn't uh, act upon it, because coming weeks, many people will become very sick, people will die. And I think personally, we should stay at home as much as possible. But that's my opinion. And that was a dangerous thing to do. But it's really about the impact and indeed your values. And uh, we knew we knew this was going wrong. So I really felt very strongly that I needed to speak out. And that was the same for many of my colleagues. And there are other occasions when I when I think the impact is less uh, uh, important than, okay, I will remain silent. 
But as a scientist, you should always be available to defend your advice. Whether you do it proactively, that's another thing, I think. But if a journalist asks you, you need to defend the, def uh, the advice. That's a really interesting. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so the, the suggestion, if I understand you rightly, is that, okay, um, sometimes the the possible outcomes can be so uh, so dramatic that the, the principle of keeping your mouth shut kind of gets overruled by the board. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, Nicola, I see your little yellow hand. Would you like to, to say hello? We don't hear you, Nicola. It doesn't look like you're muted, but we don't hear your sound. Uh, you may need to select the right microphone, which is a little arrow next to the mute button in Zoom. Uh, okay, I haven't managed to figure it out. Um, I, I, do, I think Heather might want to uh, say something on this question as well. Heather, the one thing that was crossing my mind is this, this the word duty, because it's one thing to say you have a duty to speak out publicly, but um, there's also, there are less strong words to use there, right? You might have the, the option. I think it's a duty, a default to duty. Um, and I'll explain why. So when you're a science advisor, you have a three-way obligation. I think this is why science advising is really hard. Um, you have an obligation to the science and the scientific community. You have an obligation to your advisee. And you have an ad obligation to the public. Right? And you have to meet all three obligations all the time. Total pain to do all three. Right? Really hard. But that means if a politician ignores your advice, like I agree with Siobhan that you don't want to you know, be like, oh, I feel, you know, it's about me that <laughs> the that's a terrible motivation for going public. But the public needs to know what your advice was. Now, maybe you know you can say the politician might have had good reasons for ignoring your advice, but the public needs to know what your advice was so that they can evaluate their elected officials and how they act in light in light of the advice. If you don't tell them what your advice was, they can't act, they can't evaluate the politicians' actions and see whether or not they actually want to vote for them again. <laughs> right? this, is, this is like a really important function in democracy. So I think the default duty is to speak publicly. And then there might be overriding considerations. Um, you know, like if you, uh, there might be some public report that no one's reading and so you're like, well, it's out there but no one's actually going to be harmed by it. And you understand why the politicians maybe, you know, overruled it. And you are kind of interested in keeping that trusted space. And so it doesn't seem very, okay, well then, you know, maybe you don't have to say anything too publicly unless asked, right? Um, but, you know, in general, I think the default for a science advisor is to speak to the public about any time they feel like their advice is just not attended to because the public has a right to know. Right, the democracy argument, basically. Yeah, very good. Um, I, I, ah, okay. I was about to say I've been informed that Nicola has fi fixed his audio issues, but announced that he's left the meeting. So, Nicola, if you're still here under a different name, then please feel free to to raise your hand. I see that Siobhan would like to say something, um, but I also have a message that Esther Kenton, uh, one of the attendees, would like to speak but can't raise her hand. So, Esther, perhaps if you, uh, would like to say hello, that would be great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm I'm a I'm a lecturer and a little bit into research on plastic, uh, on plastic regulation, and I did a little bit research together with my students, for example, to see whether there are actually policy advice from uh, scientists in the plastic research because we have an overwhelming uh, research uh, studies on plastic pollution. But there is hardly any policy advice from uh, researchers. It's coming now, but in the beginning, there wasn't hardly. But if you will ask them one on one, they would have some advice. But you know, almost any research would end, more research is needed. So as long as there's kind of scientific uncertainty, it seems like, well, research researchers are scientists, uh, are hesitant to make conclusions towards policy but you know we we have now this restriction dossier on, on on microplastics and there there are so many policy implications that might come from recent research so i would suggest sometimes 
scientists to call out uh, and, and make those uh, interpretations. Uh, I'm sorry, with the, with the previous question, I wrongly pressed the wrong uh, side. So it might be that it's me, you know, we, we <laughs> didn't agree or did agree, but at least, well, uh, you know. But what, but what did, did you screw up the one about uh, uh, doing the interpretation or the one about the hot dog? Uh, no, no, uh, not, not the hot dog. The last not the hot dog one. one. Okay. The <laughs> one. No worries. So, Thank so you. As, a, as a researcher on regulation, uh, it, it would be really helpful sometimes to know, even if it, you know, it's not conclusive, to at least see some some policy options or to have some recommendations uh, of scientists, although it's preliminary or you know premature, as such. Gotcha. Thank you very much, um, Siobhan, and then Nicola from the audience, and then we need to move on to the next question. I think. Sure. Yeah, so just a really um, short point, um, very much um, along the lines of what Heather and Stephen were talking about. I think I was taking uh, taking this question from, from the basis, my understanding being that all scientific advice that feeds into policy should clearly be transparent and should be public. So uh, for exactly the reasons, the very good reasons that have already been discussed. So for me, I wasn't thinking about, you know, should it be that a scientist should be able to say what kind of advice they gave and why? Of course they should. And that absolutely, I would totally agree with Heather. That is an obligation, in fact. But I think, to my mind, I think there's a difference between being very transparent and it being publicly available to coming out after the fact when advice has been ignored to say, I have a duty to speak out. So I think um, back to our first question in terms of what we mean by interpretation, I think we need to be clear in respect of, of how we're interpreting this question. So, so all advice that feeds into any process should absolutely be, not alone for the democracy argument, but because there are certain trusted advisors, and I think that was the point that was being made, who will feed in on a very regular basis and may have a particular view that might, you know, and, and it's important that that advice be available so that other scientists can actually interrogate it and perhaps disagree with it. Um, so it serves a number of purposes. Great, thank you. Nicola, uh, would you like to make your contribution? Can I make a point, Toby, while we're waiting for Nicola to come back? I think he's here. Uh, and I see that he's unmuted, but we still don't hear him. Okay, Ron, go ahead. Uh, it's just, um, I agree with what you know, Heather and Siobhan and others have said here, and, and, and I voted with the normal distribution, because there are issues, and uh, there are, are really concerning issues, because um, the example I have in mind is under a certain administration, uh, the Trump presidency, and what happened to the Environmental Protection Agency and the scientists who spoke out against Trumpian policy, right, um, in the Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, you know, um, they were replaced with political appointees. They were replaced with appointees from within uh, the uh, uh, industrial vested interests, you know, with distinct market interests. Um, they were assigned to tasks that weren't affiliated. I mean, I got all this information from the Union, Union of Concerned Scientists, who were very informed on these matters. I mean, the most crass example was the idea that you couldn't write a document for the EPA that had the phrase climate change, because the Trumpian administration did not agree with it. So it is a very, it, you know, of course, there is a duty. But uh, this is where, in ethical terms, we talk about a virtue, and that virtue is courage. Because, you know, you need to be courageous and you, you know, you're risking your career, your job, your livelihood. So that, <laughs> that's why I went with the normal distribution. It's, it's extremely problematic. Of course, we should do that. But you need to be very courageous and perhaps, perhaps even have an, an alternative source of income. Yeah, so that's very interesting. So I, I see absolutely what you mean about the courage to kind of put your own interests aside in favour of what you think is the right thing to do. But of course, those scientists who were reassigned or fired then no longer had the opportunity to influence the, the process of policymaking from the inside that they previously had. So do you think there's a... Um, 
do someone else who wants to speak do you think that there is a balancing act that needs to be done there between um how much you think you can continue to contribute if you keep your mouth shut and stay on the inside versus the impact you can have if you cut and run and, and go public about it exactly and you must conduct a personal risk assessment as well if you as you like as a community risk assessment about you know was this information so important to the public good that you could, are willing to um, take a chance with your own career but it is a risk assessment and it's this notion of you know the the the, the public benefit overriding your personal self interest yeah, very good. Uh, we must move on or else we I mean, we could obviously talk about this for a lot longer. But uh, let's move on to our third question. Toby, we no longer see the screen with the question. I know. I'm trying to get it going again. It skipped on and I don't understand why. I apologize. It's a different question now. It's not the same that was before. So I hope you now see question three. Mm -hmm. Different stakeholder interests should be represented by scientists within science advice organizations. Mm -hmm. Whoop. Heather, you're chuckling to yourself as the little blue dot moves around. What's on your mind? <laughs> um so I just uh, partly it's that given the discussion we've already had so far and the acknowledgement of the necessity of values in the framing of science advice and the decision of you know what counts as sufficient evidence and the assessment of what might be plausible options um yes different stakeholder interests you know should be represented by scientists within science advice organizations, because you want that expertise and the values together, but you also don't want, you know, stakeholder interests that are so strong that people end up being what I've called inquire facades, you know, sort of like dogmatically situated folks who just are not going to be responsive to other points of view and evidence. Um, and so that's really the sort of the, the thing that's trickiest about, about this issue. Um, and I think it's just sort of funny, like watching how like everyone's kind of humping it in the middle, <laughs> right? That's kind of this, um, and I think that's that's probably the tension that's underlying that kind of thing. Like, yeah, you do want those interests, but you you don't want the the dogmatism that might come with some interpretations of that interest, because that could really distort a science advising process. I'm crying out loud. Why does this? Why is that happening? Well, voting can continue. Technology. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, so, the, so you did say, Heather, that the people were kind of clumping in the middle, but actually there was a skew towards agreeing with this, right? I mean, the, the average was, I think, three point three five, but there was a skew towards the to, towards agreeing with the statement. Um, Miguel, what do you think? And I'll try and resurrect the screen share while you're talking. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, Toby. Uh, yes, I was among those who said who gave five. So yes, I very much agree with that. Uh, actually, I do think that all the different voices should be heard. Then, uh, how, uh, which you know, then then you have to make the choices. And uh, among those is the interest, and among those different voices, and and you know, you you need to find the right balance, and you know, you you need to make a certain selection, right? But you need to hear them. Right, we might think differently, but we need to listen to everyone, and that's the very much the big point of the democracy. And, so, and it is also about the transparency, so not leaving some of the voices which are uncomfortable under the carpet, and presenting only those are which are in line with your 
understanding of what is what is right. So I am on the on the on the side of those who strongly agree with this statement. So if I may ask you a brief follow up question. So we need to hear these voices and we need to hear them as part of scientific advice institutions. Is that your position? Uh, yes. Yes, as well. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, perhaps one more our panelists. Siobhan? Hey, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Nicola, we can hear you. Hooray! <laughs> Hello. I'm afraid you, you, you missed your, your opportunity for the original comment, but please feel free yes. to, uh, yes. to wave I, if you have it. I'm sorry, many thanks uh, for uh, your, your patience. And I just no would uh, like to um, highlight that in complex environments, uh, action it might be something different uh, from uh, knowledge of what might happen based on, on models, meaning that uh, action might change the premises on which uh, uh, models uh, and forecast uh, have been uh, uh, devised, uh, designed, uh, and uh, and so on. So uh, when it comes to decide uh, how to act uh, and which action to undertake, uh, uh, I'm not completely sure that uh, science uh, and scientists might uh, necessarily uh, know uh, what to do and what might be the consequences of the actions that uh, uh, might be uh, undertaken, and uh, and so my my comment uh, is that uh, this uh, simple fact and the, uh, this paradox that by acting we might uh, completely change the context uh, and so enter in something that scientists might not have a say on uh, might determine the, the need for a, a clear cut <laughs> separation uh, between uh, what science uh, can suggest and uh, which are the actions. Uh, that might be taken. We might reason about uh, the range and the impact of the actions that might be undertaken because the smallest, the impact, uh, uh, the, uh, the the most, uh, the easiest might be to foresee uh, uh, the, the consequences. But when nowadays, especially when we pretend to undertake global actions, uh, I'm not completely sure uh, that uh, scientists uh, uh, can have uh, can know you know which are the consequences. Uh, uh, of uh, the, the undertakings, and, and that's it. Thank you. And so the, the implication then is to be a bit more cautious about speaking out publicly, right, as a science advisor, I see. Understood. Yeah, great. Um, I see a hand from Anna Maria. I wouldn't mind hearing from one more panelist, and then we'll come to you, Anna Maria, after that. Uh, I can see Ron's hand. Siobhan, unfortunately, has appeared from my screen. I said, oh, there we are. Okay, here we go. So, um, Siobhan. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think, um, uh, but I think we need to be really careful about this one. So I think that the, uh, there needs to be um, a degree of honesty on all sides in respect to this. So if scientists want to um, have represent stakeholder interests um, as part of science advice organizations, and I think there's an argument, a strong argument to be made for that, then that needs to be transparent. Um, because there is a certain narrative that you um, come across very often, which is that scientists can often present themselves as uh, their research is merely involving empirical questions about what the evidence is, uh, you know, that there's uh, that it's it's suffice to just basically point out where where there's limiting evidence or, you know, where where the evidence is not complete, etc. But I think we all know and we've had that discussion, so I won't um, labor the point that that, of course, is not necessarily the case. So I think that the strong, you know, the fact that science scientists are approached to be part of policymaking processes is because they're seen to have this very privileged position where they're in possession of this empirical knowledge that they can impart to other people. Um, but I think, and, and that's fair enough, um, but I think we also need to be honest about the fact that, as we talked about, it is not, you know, it kind of diverts um, the argument away a little bit from realizing that we're framing these debates around purely epistemic 
kind of um, factors. And in fact, there's a whole lot of other things going on and non-epistemic um, um, uh, things that are feeding into it. So I think, yes, if scientists uh, want to, to, to be represented and to have their interests represented, but then they need to be completely transparent about what those interests are. And let's be have an honest dialogue about the fact that it's not just about epistemic issues. Um, thanks. Very good, thank you, Stephen. And then Tomislav, and then we will have an yep. uh, attempt at question four. Yeah, it's my personal opinion that it's really important to separate the roles very clearly. And as a scientist, you do not represent the stakeholder, I think. Then you really should go by the evidence, the facts, and do that in, a, in an as neutral possible way as possible. Completely neutral is never possible, I, I agree. But uh, and then in a second stage, stakeholders should be consulted. For me, that's rather the the um, uh, the role of the politicians and of the authorities to then consult with the stakeholders. Listen, this is what the science says. Uh, they have certain solutions we can implement. We will talk this through with you. Is that possible? Is that acceptable? What will be the consequences? So I think you would you need to separate these roles. Uh, but I've witnessed it firsthand also in the science advice. You had specialists and experts from the hospitals, from the pediatricians, and they were defending the hospitals and they were defending the children. And that doesn't work. You really need to, to look at the numbers, the facts, and then afterwards you consult the different sectors. And it's all about trust, transparency, and separating clearly the roles. Uh, that's my opinion on this. Very clear, thank you. Thomas, have the last word on this statement. Uh, thank you. So I'm I'm coming from, I would say, public administration body. I didn't have time to join you. Thomas Amicic actually uh, running head, I serve it for quality management for public administration. So I mean, what I want to say around the, the stakeholders, what we are now seeing in Croatia as, as, as some kind of uh, pitfall is that we don't have clear stakeholder management guidance or procedures because I, and actually it's fitting together with the last comment uh, the stakeholder mapping identification management and uh, mapping and management should start apart from public administration public uh, organization level in bigger ministries each directorate or maybe each policy should have each stakeholder map i would say and then I think that uh, that I would say it's up to us, politician, not politician, but civil servant, to to make this, to offer this to scientists, so that they check if this is okay or not, and then add if something is missing. But this is the area where there is a lot of a lot of things to be done. I would say to to clearly identify, I would say, the stakeholders and their expectation towards, I would say, policies that we are. Uh, accountable to provide to them. And I would say that that's, that's something, I mean, some areas it's good, for example, EU funds, project management, some areas are, I would say, with EU influence and EU pressure properly defined, but some, I would say, national policies are, are a little bit weak in this area of stakeholder management. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know there is more to say. We will move on to question four, which is the final question we have remaining. I make it 16 minutes of our session. We will finish on time. So here is question four. Fingers crossed that we don't have another technical wobble. It's my duty as a scientist to advocate for the changes in society or in policies that my assessment of the evidence indicates are necessary. Oh, look at that voting skew. Some overlap, I suppose, here with the earlier question about um, speaking out publicly when the politicians ignore advice, especially with the comment you made, um, Stephen, about that sometimes it, it, it really matters like how severe the consequences are that you see. Yeah. Ron, what do you think of this? Um, I'm far to the left on this one, Toby. Um, it's you, not you, strong, you strongly disagree? I strongly disagree. Okay. Because it's not my duty as a scientist to advocate for changes in society, but it is my duty as a citizen. And it's the recognition of the many roles that scientists must take on, okay? So as a scientist, maybe not, you know, um, be balanced, to be impartial, to be neutral, to be, uh, you know, say, search for the truth, whatever that is. And it's, so it's not my duty there, but it is my duty as a citizen to look at all those option appraisals, to look at the, the truth, 
and whatever biases might be in it, and then to advocate for the change as a citizen. Simple. <laughs> uh, so simple, yeah. So uh, that's a very nice theoretical distinction. Do you think, Ron, that you could change hats in practice in that way? Uh, I think you have to. I, I mean, you know, I think you must do that um, all of the time. And sometimes it's about moral decisions. You know, sometimes it's about saying, you know, I I can't conduct this piece of research because I can see the risks, I can see the damage. I mean, that's an that's an ethical choice. Um, so, you know, when I'm doing that, even though it might be a cherished idea that I have um, about my particular field of expertise, if I think there's going to be harm, then I have to not do it. Um, and uh, there may be occasions when one conducts the research, does the science, and then you make a decision about whether it should be disseminated or not. And, and you know, I'm doing that as a scientist because as a scientist, I must disseminate Otherwise, my career ends. I, you know, I must publish or perish. I know that. On the other hand, as a, a morally worthy and good citizen, if I can see it as risky and perhaps doing harm, then I'll make the decision not to publish. That's really interesting. That's an interesting analogy, I suppose, perhaps. Heather? Yeah, so um, I think actually the duties of the scientist as a scientist have changed in the last 20 years. It is now the duty of the scientist as a scientist to not publish if the publication would be genuinely harmful. That is what the AAAS has said. That's what the National Science Council said. That's the, what the World Economic Forum now says. Scientists are responsible for the impacts of their work on society. Right. So that's changed. And that it didn't used to be the case. So go on, go ahead. Not, in the 20th century, that was not the case. If you were doing basic research, you were not responsible for the impacts of your work. That has changed. It's really important that it's changed. So, um, you know, I, Ron, I think actually it is, there is no like, if it's scientists, you just publish or perish. No, if you're a scientist, you have an obligation as a scientist to try to think about all of the ways in which your work might help or harm society. That's where we are now. Um, and I think the dual use debate made that like a necessary consideration. Okay, so what does that mean for thinking about the sorts of issues of like advocacy? Is it okay for a scientist to be an advocate? Um, this is a really sort of important question. Uh, of course, a lot of people think scientists should be an advocate for science. <laughs> that's a, what about for changes in society it seems like that's mixing the values in a potentially dangerous way but i think this is still laboring under this idea that you know science should be value free and that values are just a source of bias or contamination for science instead of thinking of values as an essential component of doing good responsible science values can bias science Biases can arise from values, but values also can direct our attention in important ways, help us make good judgments about what we should do. So there's nothing essential about the relationship between values and bias, right? It, it depends on what values you're using and what roles they're playing. So we have to just be clear about the values that we're actually using when we're framing science advice and assessing evidence and how we're doing it so that um, we can show like we're not being biased, even if it's values being woven in, in a responsible way. Right? And this is, I think, the really difficult shift that all science advice needs to go through in the conceptualization of what they're doing as science advisors. Okay, mm -hmm. that's enough for me. But so, but Heather, so that's, that's a qualified agree with this statement, right? It is a qualified agreement with the statement. I, yeah. I, 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 you know, I'm kind of, this is one of the ones I'm like, well, it depends. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> like, what does the advocacy mean? And, you know, like, how are you doing it? And yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, okay. Indeed. Yeah. Stephen. Yeah, it's it's a, it's really a difficult thing here. Eh? Uh, in Belgium, we now have a discussion in the public debate that a lot of scientists are too left wing and we should have more right wing scientists. I think that's horrific. The fact that we're all even having this discussion as a scientist, you should not be left or right wing. You should be a scientist. Eh? So I, although maybe that's a bit uh, a, a utopia, but but that's how it should be. Your science should be neutral. But on the other hand, you should also 
if your science tells you certain things that need to happen or need to change, that you should be willing to defend and advocate for those changes. But it should be science-based and not some kind of ideology or activism or whatever belief system you have. Very difficult to disentangle, I agree, impossible, but that's what we should strive for. And I, I'm, I'm really horrified by a discussion about left-wing and right-wing scientists. That's, that's the, the fight, that's the end of science, eh? if we start uh, thinking about it this way. Definitely in my field, it may be a little bit different in social sciences, etc. Or even there, it shouldn't be play a role, I think. Uh, but when you're more in the medical field or the exact sciences, your political ideology should really not matter on on, on your, your your the quality and uh, the the um, communication on your science. But we should defend the science, I think, and advocate the changes that the science tells us that are needed. Uh, that that's another thing I also believe. Thank you very much. I worry a little bit about that only in that if we are all, if we were all kind of perfectly rational beings, both our scientific views and our political views ought to be informed by the same stuff, namely like what we see in the world around us and what we think will make a difference to change in the world around us. So, I mean, you might, somebody might argue, well, the reason scientists tend to skew left wing is because they have a view of the world, which gives them both their scientific perspective and their political perspective. I don't know. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a thought. Um, we have only a few minutes remaining. I would love uh, for Priyanka, who has just raised her hand, to be able to contribute right now. Hello, Priyanka. Hi. I'll just chime in quickly, and maybe it will uh, add some complexity to the argument, but uh, highlighting the same thing that you picked up on, Toby, in the previous question of the difference between right and duty in this in this perspective as well, that of course I agree with what uh, the previous panelists uh, for Heather, I think, said that scientists do have an obligation to advocate for and to let the public know, for instance. But then my question would be, what does this sentence imply? Is it a scientist who is employed specifically to provide assessment on a particular policy aspect by the government or a scientist who's conducting research by themselves and arriving at a certain conclusion also has a duty, a duty to then go out and uh, advocate uh, very assertively for that change, or is that an option? Is that a moral option? Again, uh, colored by the pre, uh, colored by the political scenarios we're now living in in various areas, mm -hmm. right? So again, just I completely agree with what the panelists have said, and that we do a person uh, has to kind of advocate for the change that he wants to see, or he or she wants to see. But then again, my question would be to hear more opinions on that part of duty versus right or whether it's a moral judgment on that aspect yeah yeah well i mean all these statements have been phrased basically as strongly as we could right but there's always yeah. a question of degree of obligation right from yeah. a firm obligation to something you really kind of ought to do all the way down to like it's absolutely your free yeah. i'm sorry i i didn't introduce myself so my my role sort of falls more in the science communication aspect and this question arises so from my experience and let's say working in some government of India science communication projects and then working in the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN in Geneva, and then sort of seeing how science and scientific organizations function and how their research is funded and how much of it then feeds into uh, scientific research and policy making. So, and how, what is at stake when scientists do speak out sometimes? Great, thank you. Uh, I see more hands. I'm very sorry that we are going to have to draw the discussion to a close. Uh, so sorry for those. I, I saw a couple of messages in, in the chat and also a hand uh, waving, but uh, we have to finish on time, I'm afraid. Um, I would like each of our panelists to take maybe one minute uh, to, to make any final comments. What I'm particularly interested in, since I now have to go and report back on this session on the plenary stage of our conference here in Brussels, is what you think the key takeaway from your perspective should be that I should feed back to that audience. Um, we will go uh, in the reverse order of how I see you on my screen, which will hopefully reverse what we originally had. So that means we'll be starting, please, with Stephen. Well, um... My closing remark would be that uh, I think trust is crucial. Uh, trust in science and trust in government. 
And the way to keep the trust is to make sure you clearly separate the roles uh, of everybody. Uh, always make very clear in what role you communicate. Uh, is that as a scientist or as an expert? Because for me, that's not the same. Is it as a lobbyist or as a risk manager or as a politician? And that should be really clear and transparent. Uh, I also think that science itself should be neutral. You should look at the data and the facts and should not be, let's say, somehow driven by ideology or, or specific belief system. Um, so that would be my, my, uh, my final remarks on this. But trust and separation of roles is for me key. Thank you very much. Siobhan, you're up. Thanks. Uh, I suppose my parting thought would be that obviously we all agree that methodologically robust and ethically grounded kind of scientific evidence is, is required to inform policy. But I think we need to um, acknowledge that evidence is generated in lots of different ways. It's translated through a number of kind of diverse conduits. Um, and what we probably need is a better uh, and more common understanding of what we actually mean by evidence, uh, what we mean by policy, and to agree the rules of the game when different parties come together to, to shape public policy. And very much agreeing with uh, Stephen that it's so important that everybody is transparent about what their role is and what the underlying values are that they're bringing um, to that discussion. Thank you very much. Ron, you're next. Um, yes, I agree with Siobhan's uh, <clears throat> and Stephen's points, um, <clears throat> and largely with the rest of my colleagues too. Um, I, I want to repeat the point that, that um, uh, keeps coming back, and that is about this idea of policy advice and being in some kind of way, a, a kind of a, a, a pure direct connection between good evidence, reliably um, resourced, and the policy making decision. Uh, process. Um, it's a highly contested domain. Um, good scientists aren't necess necessarily the most powerful um, stakeholders in this domain. They are stakeholders, that's true, but they have to compete with a whole range of diverse stakeholder interests, and power is not distributed evenly um, amongst all of these stakeholders. And what we need to watch out for the so-called congenial researchers who work for big pharma, for big food, for agri-industry and so on, and growing in the field of AI and robotics. We've got to watch out for that kind of very, very strong vested interest, which is informed by the science that they're conducted, but, but may, maybe in fact a lot more optimistic uh, in terms of the, the, um, the effects on society and communities as a consequence of that kind of work. Um, so, and we also need to maintain those links with um, with policyholders, so that um, policymakers, so that we we can try and influence them to say, "I'm only interested in ethical evidence," you know, rigorously connected um, and responsibly sourced. Um, uh, and again, that was part of what my project, the ProRes project, was all about: to try to get people to sign up to uh, an agreement. A bit like a Hippocratic oath for policymakers and and evidence gatherers uh, in general. Thank you. That's really that's a really interesting point that it's not just about scientists signing up to do ethical research, but about policymakers signing up to be interested in it to discriminate. Exactly uh, right. Exactly. Very right. good. Thank you, Migla. What's your final words? So my my final thoughts are basically that while well, this session and generally this conference, this continuous questioning of science advising and policy making nexus is very beneficial for all the parties involved and not only those involved directly, so the scientists and policymakers, but also to those who are subject to these decisions and that is society at large and questioning means dynamic nature, not stagnancy of this nexus. So because of technological advancements, pandemics, climate change and you name it, we need to constantly check whether this nexus is functioning properly. And uh, while we talk about the technological adv advancements, I want to point out that we're also witnessing the emergence of new advisors. So generative artificial intelligence is here to stay and soon, if not already, policymakers and scientists alike will seek the advice, suggestions and inspiration. In it. And we should work together, I think, to show that perhaps even to ourselves, that policymaking for humans, our societies and our planets 
is best made by humans and not by other means. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, interesting interesting comment. Thank you. Uh, and Heather, I think you're up last. Hooray. Um, so I, I agree that trust is a key issue here. Um, I agree that um, relying on AI to do any kind of processing data, given how much AI just lies blithely, um, is a super untrustworthy. Uh, so we should definitely do the human route. I disagree, though, with Stephen, that neutrality is the way to go to think about this. And that's because I think science advice needs to have a representation of different values, not ideological fixed positions, but different values um, in order to generate trust by a pluralist public. So the values that are in society need to be represented in the scientific community and in the science advising bodies so that when science advisors say they're doing something in the public interest, the vast majority of the public will be able to say, yes, there are people there who are looking out for my interests, but with the requisite expertise and judgment, um, you want to trust an expert who would make the judgments you would if they had your values and the requisite expertise. So that means the role of the scientists in that role is, is not to be ideologically driven, but to care about the practice of inquiry. And so how to create the spaces where this kind of inquiry process, where thinking about the evidence and the value considerations can take place in a constructive, ongoing way is, is the crucial thing for trust. Um, and so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you to all of our speakers, Siobhan, Heather, Migla, Ron and Stephen. Um, I'm very glad that some of the discussion was difficult because that was kind of the intention and we didn't even figure out whether a hot dog is a sandwich or not. Um, thank you also to the audience, uh, especially those who were brave enough to, to contribute to the discussion and enrich it. 